All right. Hey, folks. Uh, thank you, Christo. Uh, my name is Samant. I am a third year PhD student at UCSD. And this work was done uh, with my collaborators from UCSD and UChicago. So uh, here's the context. Today, if you want to send an email from a source to a destination, various cloud-based vendors are involved. Uh, previously, mail delivery used to be an on-premise thing where somebody would ship you the infrastructure or you would self-host. But today, everything is offloaded to the cloud. So your email provider on either side can be any cloud provider, like Gmail or Microsoft Exchange. And to sort of fit into this model today, if you want to do email filtering, previously this also used to be on-premise, where somebody would ship you a physical box. You would install it in your setup. Uh, but today, just because your email provider is also cloud-hosted, email filtering is now outsourced to the cloud. And you have a number of different vendors, like Mimecast, Proofpoint, Cisco, Barracuda, who do these email filtering for you. So let's look at a concrete example of how mail delivery works at UCSD. Um, if you want to send an email to some user at UCSD from, let's say, a sending server like webconf.org, uh, the first thing the sending server would do is query a DNS record. Um, and in particular, it would do the MX record for ucsd.edu. It would point to Gmail. And then your email gets sent across to Gmail. But now, let's say UCSD wants to set up email filtering using Proofpoint. Now, the MX record would point to Proofpoint, and the email would go to Proofpoint, get filtered, and then go to the final destination, which is Gmail. Now, there's a small difference here. Previously, your MX record would directly point to Gmail, but now your MX record points to Proofpoint because that's where the sending server would first send the email to, and then the filtered email gets delivered to the final destination. And the advantage of doing this is that if you have an email which is bad, then uh, it goes through Proofpoint. And for instance, if it has a malware or Proofpoint or any of the email filtering service can do additional filtering. And they do things like rewriting your links to safe links or uh, looking at your attachments and trying to see if they're malware. And then such emails are discarded and not sent ahead. But here's the catch. All is good as long as email goes through the filtering service. But let's say an attacker who controls the sending server, uh, and here it's a webconf.com, which is slightly different from webconf.org, then they can choose to route your emails directly to the email filtering provider, uh, sorry, to the email provider. And in this way, you can bypass email filtering altogether. Now, the catch here is that Proofpoint or any email filtering service has no say in this matter because it is by virtue of this bypass, the, the product which is being, which is being bypassed. Um, but the customer which is being affected is still the email filtering services customer, like Proofpoint's customer. And so for the remainder of this talk, uh, we're going to talk about the scale of this bypass. And long story short, 80% of the domains that we measured um, have this bypass problem. So given all of this context, how is it that today we can set up email filtering correctly? And the solution to do this is whitelisting. So on the email provider side, you would have to set up rules which says only accept email coming from your filtering service. So for instance, ucsd.proofpoint.com, accept, everything else, reject. And if you were to do such a rule on the provider side, then any attempts to sort of bypass email by directly routing to the provider would be rejected. Uh, and again, this has to be done on the provider side and not the filtering service side, because the filtering service, by the nature of this bypass, has no say in the matter. So the empirical question in this paper that we were interested in was, to what extent do customers allow for this bypass? And so in order to do this, uh, there are two questions we have to answer. First, given any domain, what is the filtering service that they use? And second, what is the mail provider that they use? Now, to answer the first question, it is simple, because your MX record now points to your filtering service. For instance, MX for ucsd.edu is proofpoint.com. Um, and so UCSD uses proofpoint. But the second question now is slightly harder. Why? Because previously, your MX used to point to the email provider, but now it is sort of hidden behind the email filtering service. So we don't know whether it uses for instance, Gmail or Exchange. And so the solution we came up with was to use a bunch of inference techniques. For instance, Gmail, uh, when you create an account in Google Workspace or Gmail, Google goes and creates two default accounts for you. 
postmaster at that domain and abuse at that domain. And we check for the presence of those two emails. And if they exist, then we know that the that domain uses Google as its mail provider. Similarly, for Exchange, we query a particular DNS A record of the form uh, UCSD slash edu followed by that. Um, and then we're able to tell whether the domain has used is currently using uh, Exchange as its email provider. All right, now having answered question number one and two, the real question that we wanted to answer in this paper is, can, can this setup allow for such sorts of a bypass? Uh, now, an easy way to do this is that, let's say we had friends in every domain of these filtering service customers. We could send them an email via the bypass approach and ask our friend to send back the email header. Uh, but unfortunately, we don't have so many friends. And so we had to come up with sort of an inference technique of how we do this in an automated way such that it's deterministic. And the solution we came up with was to use different heuristics. So for instance, we first initiate an SMTP session with the email provider and pretend to be an attacker from our sending server. And during the SMTP session, we realized that in the recipient phase, in the case of Gmail, we get two responses. We get a reject or an accept, depending on how the email server is configured. If we get a reject phase, it means that this email server is not accepting connections from any random sending server, like our, our attacking server. But if it does, then we know that that email server does accept. Uh, we can deliver email directly to it, routing or bypassing the email filtering service. But the key thing to note here is that in both of these cases, the email isn't actually delivered because we're able to do this inference at the receipt to stage, which is one of the chain in your SMTP session. Similarly, for Exchange, we use a similar heuristic. We initiate an Exchange SMTP session. Um, but unlike the Gmail uh, methodology, here we're able to do a similar inference technique during the data stage. And if we were to do this on an actual server, we would end up sending an email. So for us to sort of mitigate that, we would try to send an email to a non-delivery or a non-existing email address at that domain um, so that we get a bounce back. So given this methodology, we went and measured the extent of this bypass on the domain. So we did two TLDs, .edu, and a proportional set of .com domains. Um, so the first question which we were presented was, how do you figure out who the filtering service is? We mapped all of the domains, and we found that they would fit into 15 filtering services, approximately. Um, and when we were looking at the number of domains, we realized that the top three or four filtering services capture most of the market with a very long tail of filtering services who have much fewer customers. And the second question was, how do you figure out who the mail provider is? We use the inference techniques to map uh, all of those providers into Exchange or Gmail. Exchange has a slightly higher market, sorry, Exchange has a higher market share than Gmail, and Zoho was one other email filter, uh, email provider which belongs to the 1% of the market share. Now, the most interesting result was that what fraction of domains were actually bypassable, and we realized that 80% of domains, which is around 1,200 domains, had this sort of a bypass problem. Um, and then we attributed a bunch of potential reasons as to why this was happening. And we provide much more details in the paper, but the top two reasons uh, which we attributed was that one, the email filtering services would have a documentation for their customers to set up their infrastructure. And in the documentation, they would provide this sort of a whitelisting as an additional step, uh, as a nice to have feature. Uh, but unfortunately, it is their customers which are being bypassed. Um, but more importantly, we kind of found that there were mail administrators who were trying to incorporate a bunch of different MX records. For instance, uh, they would not only include MX records belonging to their filtering service, but also Gmail, just because they wanted to have a failover in case the filtering service would stop working. The priority of the MX record, uh, which is next, would take up, and that would be the next place where email would be sent to. But this sort of a restrictive model prevents you from having such failovers. Uh, so in summary, uh, we have two contributions to this paper. We first designed a methodology where we could infer the potential of this filtering bypass. And second, we audited 1,600 domains. We observed that almost 80% of them were allowing for this sort of a filtering bypass. And then we disclosed to all of the 15 filtering services uh, who then we worked with to notify their customers and sort of improve their documentation. Thank you.